This meeting is being recorded. Thank you, the computer voice. Um, so now I'm just going to run through the agenda with you all quickly. Firstly, we'll begin with some introduction from both ourselves and the panelists. Then my colleague and co-host Emma will go through some housekeeping and some ways in which you can contribute to the discussion today. Then you'll be taken through a presentation outlining our proposals for the parking per um, permit prices. Then for the remaining time, there will be an opportunity for you to put your, some questions to our panelists. And if we also have time, we'll put forward some questions in a poll for you to try and get to know a little bit about you today. So we'll start with some, with some introductions. My name is Eloise Grimes and I'm a parking support officer working in the parking policy team for parking services. Emma? My name is Emma Sampson. I'm the project support assistant and I'm with your co-host this evening. Thank you, Emma. Um, Gossica? Good evening all, my name is Foster Kent TV. I'm the Policy and Project Manager for Parking Services. And Michael, Ben? Good evening everyone, my name is Michael Ben, I'm the Senior Service Area Manager for Customer Services um, with Parking and looking forward to taking and answering your questions and having a, a really good discussion with you all this evening. Uh, thank you, um, Gossica and Michael for that. Uh, we also have a moderator working with us in the chat function of this meeting today. Um, they'll be answering any questions that you put in the chat and their name is Mark Collins. Uh, so I'll just briefly pass you over to my colleague Emma who will go through some Zoom functions with you as well as some housekeeping rules. Welcome to the meeting today. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few of the housekeeping rules. We would like to have a fruitful discussion today. So in the spirit of fairness, we would like to let everybody ask one question at a time. If there is no one else with their hand up, we'll let you ask another question. Please be respectful to the host and the guests around you. For the functions today, we'll be using a chat function. You can use the chat function to ask questions, to make any comments. The moderator will make a note of all comments made in the chat box. Any questions asked in the chat box will be transferred over to the question and answer box by the moderator. The next fun function will be the question and answer function. You can post a question and answer. To, you can post a question to the panelist in the Q&A box. This will be answered by the panelist over video. When this question is answered, I will change the question and so the, so the host will know to move on. The next function will be the hand raising function. We ask participants to raise their hand using the hand raising function if they would like to make a comment or ask a question using their voice. You will be unmuted by the host who will give you some time to ask the question. Please remember to put your hand down afterwards. Last but not least, the poll function. There will be a number of poll questions asked throughout the meeting. Please answer these polls as they come up so we can move on quickly. The meeting will be recorded and uploaded to the Citizen Space webpage. Uh, thank you so much, um, Emma. And now, so now I'd like to hand you over to, um, to Gossica, who will take th us through a presentation on the parking permit prices proposals. Thank you, Eloise. Just give me a moment while I set that up. And share my screen. Just to confirm everyone can see that. Lovely. Okay, so as I mentioned, my name is Gossica Anachibi and I'm the Policy and Project Manager for Parking Services. I'm just going to take you through some of the proposals that we've put into the uh, panel say on the future of parking permit prices. So the background is last year we invited you to take place, take part in a consultation on proposals um, which set out the future of parking in Hackney. These proposals are contained in our draft parking enforcement plan. Um, the PEP is the council's primary parking policy and strategy document, which governs parking related decisions in the borough. Uh, following this consultation and having reviewed the feedback, we are now inviting you to give your, your views on um, the parking permit prices only for a period of three weeks, um, which means the consultation closes next week on the 6th of July. 
So what's the reason why we're doing this? The revised parking permit proposals, you know, we had a start on price point for electrics. Originally it was free, um, but that didn't take into consideration the pollution caused by tire and brake wear. And that's what some of the respondents said to us. So the cost of the cheapest parking permit um, should not be less than the cost of a, renting a secure cycle parking hangar in Hackney. That is what people said to us. So the pricing incentives that are in place will encourage people to opt for the greenest form of transport possible in the borough. The diesel levy. So we have a diesel surcharge. People had said to us previously that the original proposal set out um, a levy for all diesel vehicles, but this did not take into consideration some of the newer and cleaner vehicles. So one of the things we've put forward is a rise proposals, which will see only diesel vehicles that do see, which will see only the diesel vehicles that do not meet UVLA real driving world emissions standards for nitrogen oxide emissions being charged this levy. So what this basically means is that if you are RD, RDE2 compliant, then you will not be charged diesel surcharge. This change has been made in recognition for the improvements to the cars that have been coming out and manufacturer developments over the recent years. And also from what we got from the feedback when we listened to what came out of the parking enforcement plan. Why are we doing this? Submission-based charging structure. We've had one in place for a long time. And it's basically a system which allows us to, park, to charge for permits based on CO2 emissions. And drivers can find their emissions on their V5C registration certificate. And based on that emissions, they will be charged for their parking um, permit. Um, Emissions-based charging currently applies to um, most of our permits, which is all zone permits, resident permits, doctor's permits, community support permits. And what we are proposing is that we also extend it to estate and car club prices. Um, this type of charging will hopefully reduce the impact on Hackney residents and business in terms of local air quality and climate change. That's what we want to deliver as a result of using this charging structure. Um, and also to encourage people to switch to less polluting vehicles, we're proposing to introduce a number of pricing bands, to increase the number of pricing bands, sorry, from five to 13. So currently you have five pricing bands for emissions-based charging, and we want to increase that to 13, which will give further scope to be more efficient in terms of the car that you choose and pay less if you are more less polluting. Um, alongside of this, the proposals to bring in emissions-based charging will be phased in if approved over a five or seven year period, depending if you live on residence or on an estate, residence in terms of on street, on street or on an estate. So air quality, we wanted to know how people feel about air quality in the borough. It's important to us to understand if you know things that we're doing are meeting people's expectation on how we can improve air quality in the borough and how our policies match up in terms of that. So we have got a question in the booklet which um, asks us, asks you about air quality. But air quality is a term just used to describe how polluting um, the areas that we breathe. So just going into more detail with each of the proposals. Um, just to understand first that we do offer a wide range of parking permits to all of our residents and visitors and also things like visitor vouchers and, and so on and we hope that you know our parking permit prices can have an influence both can influence both parking demand and patterns in vehicle ownership so what are the changes we've made for resident parking permit prices so the revised proposal sets out electric vehicles that will be charged £50 in year one of the new PEP and that will increase by £1 each year thereafter for the lifespan of the PEP. To maintain a meaningful price difference between the pricing bands above band one, some increases have been made to the bands between two and seven. Um, but the top end of the price that we put forward in the PEP is, is largely the same. It's not exactly, but it's largely the same with what we um, previously consulted on. So what does this mean? You've got the top end, which is the year one uh, in band one, and um, previously that was zero for electric vehicle charging, and now we've introduced a band, a pricing structure, which is £50, so year one will be 50 right through to year four, and that's in the green box. In the amber box, we've um, adjusted the prices slightly, to um, 
take into consideration that now we're charging for electric vehicle charges. Now we're charging for electric vehicles. Um, and that's the proposal that we're putting forward. All the rest of the prices will be need to be adjusted. Um, the green box in the middle is where most vehicles sit at the moment. And in terms of the red box, that's largely the same for what we put forward in the parking enforcement plan originally. So what does it mean for estate parking residents? So the original proposals consulted on last year, we wanted to harmonise parking on estates with on-street emission-based charging structure. So on estates currently, it's a flat price and we wanted to introduce emissions-based charging in light of um, improving air quality across the borough and also the introduction of a diesel surcharge. So we're proposing to extend the transition period from five, which we originally put forward to now making it seven. So drivers can have more time to adapt to the proposals and make the necessary tech over a necess necessary changes over a longer period of time. Um, what that will mean is that we will see the prices increase between two and three pounds a year um, for the emissions based charging on for electric vehicles and between two bands two and seven um, the prices will also increase uh, to make sure that we have a meaningful difference between the two the top end of the price again like resident permits is going to remain the same and how that looks is pretty much like this um, so it's pretty much the same in terms of in order to bring in a charge for electric vehicle charge electric vehicles um, the green one has changed the amber, the prices in the amber boxes have been um, increased to adjust to that change. The, the green box in the middle um, is still going to be largely what was put forward in the PET the last time, and the red boxes as well is largely what was put forward the last time in the PEP and was consulted on. Business permits, um, plans to remove the higher prices for parking zone A and B still remain in place. So um, if you are a business in Hackney, you will know that if you are towards the south of the borough, which is around Shoreditch, you pay a higher price for your business parking permits. Now that we, looking at the way we implement um, emissions based charging, and it's about how much you pollute, we've removed that as one of the things that we um, put forward in the PEP. As, so it's one flat rate now, regardless of where you are as a business in Hackney. Uh, and that rate will be £50 in the first year and increasing by £1 over the next five years for businesses. And it's in line with what residents pay as well. So it's not going to be any different to what a resident pays. Um, but it will have an, the added benefit of being able to move that one permit across three different vehicles with only one vehicle being covered at any one time. The prices between bands 2 and 13 have remained the same to what we originally proposed in the parking enforcement plan. Um, consultation that took place last summer. And how does this look? So in the black box, you will see that those are the prices that have been introduced for um, this for our proposals. These are the ones that we're putting forward for the proposals. So instead of being zero for electric vehicle charging, it is now 50 through to 54. Um, and compared that to what it was before, it was 21 pounds. And for all the other parking park, parking permit prices, if you look on the column which says A to B, you will note that the prices are actually going down instead of going up. Um, for a large, in A and B, it's all pretty much all gone down, I can see, yeah, apart from maybe the last two um, price points, price point 13. Uh, and for all other zones, there are some discounts that are going to be applied if vehicles are less polluting. And then finally, our community support permit. There are still plans in place to have the, to replace the existing health and social care permit with a community support permit. Um, and if you don't know what a community support permit is, it provides um, essential cover for organizations, charities going out into the community and providing care. Um, and to be eligible for this permit, you need to be in the um, community at least 30% of the time providing essential care. Uh, in the first year, electric vehicles will be charged £50 um, and then it will increase £1 each year for thereafter for the lifespan of the PEP. Um, and then 
The other thing to note is between bands two and 13, what was originally proposed in the parking enforcement plan has not changed and that will remain the, the same. And how that looks is like this again. In the black box is where we put forward the um, electric vehicle charging costs. And in the green, that is exactly what was proposed the last time when we went out to consult and we haven't made any changes to that whatsoever. So the last thing is, how can you have your say? You can complete a questionnaire online and the questionnaire link will be put into the chat for those that are in the chat so you can have a look and, and go directly online. Or you can email us or you can call us. And this all needs to be done before Wednesday, the 6th of July. Thank you, Eloise. Thank you, Gossica. Um, so now, um, so now we're gonna, gonna open the floor to questions soon. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand or type them in the Q&A function at the bottom. And so I think we've had a quite active, usually we do a chat, but I see that most people have a quite a few questions first. So um, I'm going to go to the questions. So. I know that Liam, you've had your hand up for quite a while, so I'm going to allow you to talk and to ask your question. So you should now be able to unmute yourself and ask your question, Liam. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes, cool. we can. Thank you. Okay, thanks for taking the time to take us through all that. I appreciate it. I'll keep my points uh, punchy. Um, I agree with the diesel policy um, because it, it aligns with, aligns with, with Islington and it's important to get people out of diesel cars. I'm an EV owner, uh, and I feel that the five type, the 500% increase in parking permits is a very perverse way of getting people to uh, travel in a cleaner way. Obviously, we want less cars on the road overall. That needs to happen over time, and I think that's Hackney's strategy as well. But the, um, given that um, we've got a cost of living crisis, um, and there's also, it's also incredibly, it's becoming more and more expensive to run an EV, asking residents to then if, if basically uh, pay way more for their permits seems rather perverse. Um, and I think, you know, we've, as an EV owner, we've tried to do what the council have asked, um, move to cleaner transport methods, we use chargers, et cetera, but aren't getting anything in return. It's just more and more, it's become more and more expensive to run an EV. Um, what was the logic behind the 500% increase? Because it seems quite out of line with all the other price changes in the grid. Okay, thank you for your question, Liam. Um, Michael Bed, can you answer that question, please? Uh, I'm very happy to take that one. Hi, Liam. Um, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, the answer is is that when we initially put forward proposals uh, that we consulted on last summer and autumn, um, we put out a proposal to introduce. Uh, free permits for all electric vehicles because we wanted to try and remove the obstacles to people who wanted to uh, to shift to fully electric vehicles um, in recognition for the you know, obviously of the upfront cost um, for many of, of leasing uh, or purchasing an electric vehicle and we got lots and lots of feedback um, on those particular proposals and in truth we got uh, a lot more feedback that Whilst in isolation, it seemed uh, like a, a good idea to take forward, uh, to take forward in the round, looking at the overall approach towards sustainable transport with walking, cycling, use of public transport being things that um, uh, both councillors and also members of the public who took part of the consultation felt strongly we should be incentivising above and beyond car ownership even for the greenest and least pollution vehicles mm. uh, on our streets but we needed to make sure that the pricing um the pricing was reflective of that wider hierarchy that didn't just look at the gap between the electric vehicles and the most polluting that we may have on our roads and actually take into context the other charges we have in place for the other services we've got and in particular one thing that came through loud and clear was that lots and lots and lots of residents fed back to us felt that we should not be charging less for an electric uh, vehicle permit than we were for providing secure on street um, cycle parking provision and free cycle hangers. Um, and that's something that we've taken away and we've reflected on. Um, sure. And on balance, whilst I recognise that you know, there, there are arguments both ways, 
um, the argument of ensuring that we're able to ensure that we've got the right pricing signals to help people who want to be able to cycle and to secure space in one of our cycle hangers, that we're incentivizing that through the pricing that we've got across all of our, our on-street prices is why we've put forward the revised proposals we have. Um, th thanks for your explanation. I understand differential uh, um, and the, the logic behind that. Um, it does still feel like an incredibly um, big price rise given the environment at the moment and, and one that comes in quite quickly. Um, I know you've got to put these plans in place fairly soon. Um, just one other quick point as well, and I can, put, I can expand on my objections in writing. Mm -hmm. This is actually a, on a different subject. Permits for households that with more than one car. Um, I've always felt that, um, you know, I should keep my voice down because the window's open, but, you know, my neighbor, <laughs> I have a neighbor who has three cars and it's just seems, it just seems incredibly kind of unfair that they're paying the same amount for each car, taking up a lot of space on the road, when really it should be some, should be some sort of scaling based upon the residents within a particular household. And could there something be done around that to maybe have a cost for one car then a slightly higher cost for the second, and so on and so forth. I think that's a very fair and valid point. And actually, as part of, our, of the consultation proposals we put forward last year, we did include, um, and we had popular support for the introduction of pretty much exactly what you've just described there. So um, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but we are going to be introducing a sliding scale so that for households who've got more than one car, um, with a permit attached, there will be um, a percentage increase in the fees for second and third cars that we're proposing to introduce uh, over the, the lifespan of our new parking enforcement plan. Um, because you know, you're quite right, we've got very limited curb space within Hackney, um, and ensuring that we're being fair and equitable in how we're providing and catering for everyone's different needs is extremely important. Um, and we recognise that for those who may wish to have the perceived luxury of having more than one vehicle um, attached to their household, that there's uh, a need for us to, to look to building something of that sort, which uh, is why we brought forth proposals that, that will address that. Great. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Liam. Okay. Uh, thank you, Liam. Um, I'm good to um, put you back, um, to take your permission to talk away. If you have any future questions, just raise your hand again. So. Um, I will go to, um, I'm sorry, I can't see the order, so I'm going to um, allow Peter Krieg to talk now and ask his question. And then I'm aware, Dominic Young, you, you'll be next and then we'll go to the Q&A. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Brilliant. Okay, so I'll just echo uh, Liam, say thank you very much for the presentation and taking the time to, you know, in your, obviously, outside of your work hours to speak to us is much appreciated. Um, I commented on the previous consultation regarding estate parking permits. I live on the Burma Court estate. Um, I actually park on the street because the car park for my section in my area, I'm off the side of the estate, is very small. But a lot of my neighbours and other people on the estate have vehicles and park on the estate. I don't know if everyone else is aware of this, but the in year one increase in the parking permit for estate vehicles, a standard vehicle, is 98% increase. So the parking permit doubles year one and goes up by 550% over five years for a band nine vehicle on the estate. Um, the justification for that by you guys seems to be uh, item 5.36 in your document. Furthermore, at present, the state permits are referred to the price of on-street permits creating a two-tier system. This situation means residents often living alongside one another are paying vastly differing amounts for parking. Now, you all look quite young, but that to me sounds like the justification the Thatcher government used for the poll tax, which is everyone should pay the same amount regardless of their means and their ability to pay. Generally, people on council estates are of a lower income, and it seems to me that you're disproportionately charging them compared to residents who buy on-street parking permits because their increases are massive compared to a standard on-street parking permit. The estate parking zones are very, very small, very, very limited. You can't actually go anywhere. You can't drive anywhere and park to go to a shop or a school or a friend on an estate. 
within a uh, CPZ, a, a, a on-street parking zone. You can actually drive to the shops. You can often drive to your kid's school. You can drive to a friend's house, etc. So these are not comparable zones, and I don't understand why they would be charged the same. I think it's grossly unfair. Finally, I have emailed and asked you to tell me how many electric vehicle charging points in Hackney are located within the council estates. You replied back to me and told me you'd let me know by the 10th, which is all a whatever, the day after the consultation ends, which I thought was a bit interesting. So I looked it up myself on your website. There are currently no electric vehicle charging points located on any council estate in Hackney that I could find. So even if a resident could afford a new electric vehicle to avoid paying the massive increase in parking permit prices, they still wouldn't be able to charge it at their property. It's illegal, I've read on in your document, to run a lead out of your house and across the pavement. How can, so I just think it's utterly, utterly unjustified increase. You're targeting the poor, generally poor people, at a time when they are already struggling to survive. And I'm astounded that Hackney Council would do that. They're meant to be a Labour government, and I'm really, really appalled. I'm a member of the Labour Party. And I'm sickened by what you're doing. I have to tell you, it doesn't affect me in the slightest. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about my friends and neighbours and people who live around me. You are going to slaughter them. They're already struggling to pay their bills. And you're increasing their parking by 550%. These are people who work. They, they earn so little, the government up uh, adds to their salaries just so they can survive. I just can't believe you're doing it. I think it's disgusting, frankly. So I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are on that. Okay. Um, can I feel like there's a few um, points in that question. Can um, Gossica, could you um, answer um, this question, please, Peter? Okay. Thank you, Peter, for, um, for joining us today and also giving your feedback. And I do accept that, you know, in terms of estates and um, there are, uh, a parity of maybe some people that are um, well off and some people that are not well off but I think you'd also agree with me that on street and people that live on street properties it's also there as well and from the council's perspective we need to be looking at things from um, looking at pollution from every angle we can't be just looking at what's going on on, on street which you you know I think you would agree with me if I say um, on street we do still have people that maybe are of low income as well as on, on states. So from that perspective, we're looking at it holistically and we're saying that we need to do um, policies that are gonna make those changes on the state and on the street. I do accept that, you know, and this is probably one of the reasons why for us, we, we are consulting, we are asking for feedback because if there are people that are disproportionately affected by these proposals, tell us what we can do to improve that. Tell us how um, through the consultations um, can I just jump in? Sorry, but with all due respect, I did tell you at round one of the consultation and I didn't get a response from anyone at all. No one ever replied to me. And you are disproportionately affecting people on the estates. They are the average income of people on council estates has to be lower than the average income of, ha of Hackney residents who don't live on council estates. I mean, I'm, I'm, I haven't got the statistics, but I mean, I think it's for you to tell me that's not true. And I think we all know that's true. And they are being disproportionate. Why are you making their parking costs, Pat? Why are you making them parity? Why were they less before? Because they were people on a lesser income. Why are you changing that policy? Why is it now, re why was it always okay to charge people on council estates less to park? And now suddenly it's no longer okay and everyone has to pay the same. I repeat, that to me sounds like the Thatcher government bringing in the poll tax. That's exactly what they said. It's not fair. People live next door to each other. They should pay the same amount regardless. It's not right. I do want to explain that, but our policies are based on emissions and how polluting a vehicle is. And we have to think about the pollution that's being emitted into the air. And some, some of those, some vehicles are really, really old and they do need to be considered in terms of whether or not they should mm -hmm. be on our street. And that's mm -hmm. what our policies are targeting mm -hmm. towards. Yeah. And I'm not, dis and I'm not dis again, Gosco, I'm not disputing that that we need to think about it holistically, but we all, but we, know we need to also, holistically surely means everything, not just we need to cut pollution, we need to make sure people can afford to eat and we need to make sure people can afford to heat. 
And I, I sincerely believe that bringing in this policy will mean some people will not be able to eat or heat their flats in the winter in Hackney because they won't, or they'll have to sell their car and go on to benefits because they won't be able to survive with a 550% increase over five years for a typical small family car. And I, I'd urge you again, please reconsider it, please. Because we, we, we're going to really hurt people. And these are the disenfranchised who don't read this stuff, don't take the time. I'm a, I'm a chartered structural engineer. I have spent hours going through your consultation documents, going online, looking up vehicle emission data from the, from the European Union, which we used to belong to, going on your website, finding where your electric vehicles, walking around my estate, trying to find charging points to know exactly what I'm talking about now. Most people don't have the time, the wherewithal, or the, the capability of the IT to do that, right? No one's listening to their voices. Have, have you done a consultation specifically for people on council estates? Have you gone there and said, we're going to cut pollution, but we're going to raise your parking cost by 550%. What do you think? All right, Peter, can I just explain? Like, from my perspective... Course, yeah, I'll stop now, sorry. Really no, but it is really important to me. I'm a Hackney resident myself, and it's really important to me to listen to all voices in... In, in Hackney. Um, we are um, doing a targeted like, um, drop-in session for an estate that have asked us to come along in person and present and we'll do that for any other estate that would like us to do that because we want to hear specifically from people who have um, concerns with our policies. We know that you know when you do put the policies out there as a council you're not, not always going to get the right fit for everyone. You know from our policies you're going to get some people that will consider whether or not they do need to drive. You know, you're going to get people that uh, might think to themselves, actually, I use my car once a week to do the food shop. Maybe I'll get a, um, an Uber. Maybe I'll um, do a home delivery. Maybe I'll use a fit car or a car club equivalent. And therefore, you know, when you think about the stats of the, the money they're paying on petrol, when you think about the money they're paying on insurance and other things that are more priority, they will probably say to themselves, I don't need a car. You're going to get other people that are going to say, well, actually, with regards to these proposals, I have got this car that is, I didn't know it was, you know, um, polluting the air in, in the way it was. And actually, I can afford to get a better car, you know. And then you are going to get the proportion of people that might need to drive because of their work, might need to drive because of their skills and the things that they do um, in terms of their work. And for those people, we need to find out what we can do to, to support them. And that's what this consultation is about. We're never, ever with a consultation going to be able to hit the mark and get everything right first time, which is the reason why we consult. So um, I'm happy that, you know, yourself, Peter, you've had a chance to look through the documents, you've had a chance to study the documents, and you are representing people on the estate that have the same or similar viewpoints to you, because that is what we need to be able to make the right decisions. And I would like to apologise that you didn't receive um, a response to uh, an inquiry that you got if, um, that you sent to our, our team, because we are we do log all of our um, responses, and I will look into that to see what went wrong. I That's right. No, I mean, it, it took me, as I say, it took me a couple of minutes to work it out. OK, I mean, I'm just asking you that the final time, please consider the majority of people who live on council estates who are relying on a car cannot afford the increases that you're proposing. They can't. I speak to my neighbours regularly. I've helped them work out what benefits they can get. I've helped my neighbour switch a gas and electric provider to try and save her a few quid. She works at a hospital. She gets a bus. It takes her two hours to get to work by bus and two hours back. These people are struggling massively. Please consider the consequences of what you're proposing. It's, it's fine for people like me, nice middle class boy who lives in a council flat that he's bought. I don't, it's, it's no skin off my nose and it's no skin off the nose of the people who live in the streets surrounding my estate. But those people on those estates are going to suffer massively if you do this. And as a socialist Labour council, I'm begging you to not do it, OK, because it's going to really put me in a lot of difficulty campaigning for the Labour Party on doorsteps if you do this. It's, it's disgusting, yeah. frankly. And that, I'll leave it at that because I've said enough. Yeah, yeah, may, I, may I just add, though, um, from our perspective, it'd be really good if you, know, you encourage people to give their feedback. But it's not just giving their feedback, which is important. It's also making suggestions on how we can improve the proposals we put forward. So that is one of the things I would encourage you to, to ask people. It's like, okay. this is what we've put forward, but what can we do to tweak it to make it better? 
mm -hmm. we have to balance it's all about you know being transparent being open and also balancing um, um what we're putting forward you know we've got something that we need to do we have to think mm -hmm. about air quality we have to think about the climate um, emergency that we're in at the moment so you know if you can when you're speaking to your neighbors when you're speaking mm -hmm. to um, other people that are on um, estates or campaigning mm -hmm. or doing like speaking to other people about this um, consultation please also ask the question of what we can do in its place and we will definitely consider it Peter. Thank you I really appreciate that and I'll, um, I'll try and expand on it a bit in my submission and as you say I'll try and have a few more conversations with my neighbours and thank you I really appreciate you listening thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. I'm going to uh, remove the permission to talk now. Um, if you have any future questions, just raise your hand again. Um, next, we're going to go to Dominic Young, and then um, after Dominic, we'll go to the Q and A's because I've noticed there's a few uh, pictures there. So, Dominic, would you like to ask your question, please? Thank you. Thank you all <clears throat> for taking the time to talk to us. Um, I just wanted to add one point to, to what Peter said, which is I used to live on a private estate in Hackney. Uh, which is typically populated by more affluent people and this charge doesn't apply to them at all so it, it does feel to me quite regressive um, I'll move on to my my main point though because it's all good news I'm I'm one of your favorite people because I walk or cycle almost everywhere I cycle at least double the number of miles I drive every year which is good news I've cut my driving down massively uh, even better news my car is a zero emission car when it's parked like all cars because it doesn't produce any emissions at all when it's not driving um, and i only drive about two thousand miles a year but bad news for me i the, the, i want to keep my car because i use it for emergencies i use it when kids and large things need moving and i use it for use it for holidays so i don't need it much but I, it's, a, it's an old car i got it a long long time ago it has paid off all of its manufacturing emissions a very long time ago, uh, but I'm going to end up paying you about a pound for every mile I drive for keeping my car standing still. And I don't think that's fair. I think it's regressive. I think it affects people who are least able to afford a new car. And also I'd like to point out that electric cars are not emission free. There's a report from Volvo, and I put a link to it in the chat, that says depending on the type of electricity generation used, one of their new electric cars takes between 48 and 68,000, I think, miles to break even from an emissions point of view. You've got to drive that far before actually there's a net benefit in emissions, which at my level of um, driving would take me long, long beyond the end of my life. So if what you want to do is incentivize me to buy a new car uh, and, to, and to drive less, firstly, if I bought a new car, it would be worse from an emissions point of view. But secondly, if you're going to charge people in relation to emissions, you should charge them in relation to, to their actual emissions. ULES does that quite well. It doesn't do it in relation to mileage, but it does it in relation to days driven. So if I drove every day my dirty diesel car, I'd pay about four and a half thousand pounds a year in, in ULES charges, which means I'd have a very good reason to reinvest that money into, in, into a new car. And that's already worked. TfL says that they're getting less money for ULES than they thought because so many people have, have moved to lower emissions cars. Charging people for keeping their car standing still isn't fair. Charging people randomly based on whether or not they happen to live in the wrong place, all right, if you're on a private estate, all right, if you don't live in Hackney, both of those people can drive in Hackney exactly the same as me. Uh, they can spew their emissions out all over Hackney without any charge at all from Hackney. Um, and it's just a matter of bad luck. So I, I think the whole basis is I totally agree with the goal of reducing emissions. But if you get the incentives wrong, you produce perverse outcomes. And the perverse outcome in this case is either you punish people for keeping their car not used. The less you use the car, the more effectively you're paying for, for, for the mileage you, you drive. Or you encourage them to do something that is actually net worse, which is, for, in my case, because of my very low mileage, it would be insanely expensive to get a new car. And it would also be insanely expensive for the environment because I'd be bringing a whole new manufactured vehicle out of a factory to replace one that's that, that was manufactured more than 10 years ago and is, and is hardly ever used. So I'd really like you to explain, to get to the question, why it is you think that this scheme will have any impact at all on actual emissions in Hackney. It just seems to be a regressive tax that's, that's being applied randomly and punishes the opposite behaviour from that that you want to uh, you, you want to punish. 
Okay, thank you, Dominic. Um, Michael, would you like to answer this question, please? I would. Um, uh, Dominic, thank you very much for your contribution. I mean, there's a lot of, um, I think, really important points that you've raised in what you've just discussed, and I'll, I'll try and address those uh, as best I can. Um, to answer your last point first, we have uh, had emissions-based charging uh, in its current form in place since around 2014, and the evidence um, from the time that that's been in place in comparison to um, what we've seen in terms of the types of vehicles, the percentage of diesel vehicles, the percentage of high pollution vehicles we've got from the states, where we've got flat rate charge at present, shows without any doubt whatsoever that emissions-based charging has led to a shift away from more polluting diesel vehicles to, pre uh, to cleaner, greener, um, and higher percentage of electric vehicles. And indeed, mm -hmm. only over the last couple of years, we've seen the number of electric vehicles in Hackney grow from what was previously only, I think, 86 in 2018 to over 650 now. So we're moving in the right direction. Are you, sure, are you sure there's a causal link there? Is, is that, evident, is that uh, research that you can share? Because uh, was, there's, there's more factors in play than just parking charges, aren't there? And there, there, there are a great many factors involved, um, but in terms of a control group where the other factors um, in terms of you know, the change in vehicles now available on the market um, points to the fact that emissions-based charging is having an impact on the choices that uh, residents are making and businesses for that matter um, when they're choosing to, to change their vehicle. On the broader point about the fairness of charging uh, based on permit prices versus mileage, I think you know, we wouldn't argue that the perfect solution is driven through permit prices. And I think the, the Hackney's mayor is on record as saying that in an ideal world, we'd like to be in a position to look at whether or not um, we could we could look to have some form of uh, some form of um, congestion charge zone uh, in Hackney or expanded to cover Hackney. Not only because it provides the, the fairest possible mechanism, it has the biggest impact most quickly on people's choices, but also it would uh, address the one in three vehicles which neither start nor end their journey in Hackney but are travelling through the borough and contributing towards um, you know, poor local air quality all of the time. Unfortunately, as things stand at the moment, the legislation isn't in place to enable uh, individual boroughs to look to uh, take action of that sort. But all of the time, we still have some of the poorest air quality uh, of any local authority in London is having a really severe and demonstrable impact upon uh, the health of um, the people who live uh, and work in Hackney. And, um, and Hackney Council and its members are very clear both through the climate emergency and the steps they've taken already in terms of low traffic neighbourhoods um, and school streets to tackle the scourge of poor air quality in Hackney. And we all need to play our part in contributing to that. You know, within the proposals we set out within the parking enforcement plan last year, um, we set out some very big changes to what we're going to do around short stay parking to discourage people, um, particularly travelling from outside the borough, to come in and use their car to drive in and park within Hackney, which is a big, big shift. Um, the proposals we've set out here, um, you know, I've tried to keep prices um, low for residents who've got low and uh, medium pollution small vehicles but also to try and ensure that the most polluting and older diesel vehicles that we look over the course of the next five, six years to get those vehicles increasingly off Hackney streets. Um, and, and so whilst it may not be the perfect tool to achieve those ends, the evidence we've got is that it is playing a demonstrable impact in helping us move in the right direction. And until such time as national government is able to give local authorities the tools through some form of uh, road-based charging um, it's, it's the best tools we've got available to make a difference in improving air quality and reducing uh, Hackney's CO2 emissions. I'm, I'm glad you recognise it's uh, it's not a not, not not a great solution. I would point out there is an existing air quality related emissions related uh, charge that does apply in Hackney, which is the ultra low emission zone charge. Um, so it does exist. If it, if every time you drive from borough to borough, you end up paying a different charge, obviously that would get extremely complex and difficult. But I, I'd love it if you could direct me towards this evidence uh, that, that there's a causal link between these charges, which I did not pay before because I was on the private estate, same mm -hmm. dirty car, same amount of driving, 
no charge, thank you very much. Did, so completely unaware of it, just didn't, didn't ever have to interact with Hackney Parking. But I do think it would be better to go back to the drawing board and try to think of a scheme which does relate to the amount of actual pollution people create, not the potential pollution they could create if they did, if they, if they did a bad thing. I realise this is a national government thing and highly political, so it would never happen, but uh, fuel, fuel duty is one way of doing that. Ultra low emission zone is, a, is another way which seems to be working. I think hard before I drive my car now, if, um, if I don't really need to, even harder than I did before. But this is just unfair. I'm going to end up spending between this, you and various other things, three or four pounds a mile in various forms of tax. Um, and, and replacing my car would cost a huge, huge amount of money and make the situation worse. I realise that's an outlier case. You can't legislate, but it, but it does seem to me to be fundamentally on its face unfair and regressive because the people least able to afford to change their cars and the people who drive the least are the ones who are hit hardest by this. And, and I, I don't think that's right. I think the affluent people sitting in the private estates ought to be paying their share and you ought to come up with a scheme that, that's fully inclusive. Thank you, Dominic. I mean, in, in relation to the, you know, the point you raised about, about private estates, um, unfortunately, as I'm sure you can appreciate, with those being uh, privately managed and run, Hackney Council doesn't have jurisdiction over the charges that, uh, that levy for the parking spaces they have. Um, but also, I just wanted to make the point that in terms of, uh, for people who may be in a similar boat to you in terms of having a vehicle, you may have had for some period of time, um, but in practice only use uh, um, relatively infrequently, um, it's also just worth highlighting that Hackney has spent an awful lot of uh, effort in encouraging car club providers to come and invest in Hackney. We've got the densest network of car clubs, um, both ones that you can pre-book well ahead of time, which, um, which has got over 140 odd uh, in different bays across the borough, as well as uh, typically about 70 what are called floating car clubs, so cars that you can book and uh, drive away um, at a, at a moment's notice, to cater, together with vans that can also be rented for the occasions when you need to is, um, take heavy goods from one place to another, to try and ensure that for those who either uh, haven't yet bought a car, but do have occasional needs to be able to go on holiday, go to the shops, move things, or for people who may be in similar circumstances to you and are questioning or wondering whether or not continuing to keep a car together with all the running costs is something that is, is the right solution in the long run, but we've got a really strong network of car club operators that can and do um, provide a, a very viable way to give people access to a vehicle when they need it without incurring all of those additional costs of owning and keeping a vehicle permanently. Um. I'll, I'll just I'll just make one very quick point and then I'll shut up. But firstly, thank you for your point on private estates. You just highlight the fact that this is the wrong approach to tackling emissions. Um, there needs to be something better. Tackling emissions is important. Secondly, on car clubs, I have thought about it many times. I do use zip vans occasionally when I need to move big things. Last time I booked one, they moved my booking from Hackney to, I think, Hammersmith uh, at short notice. They're not dependable if what you need to be able to do is without notice, jump in and make a small trip for, for something. So yes, it's great that they're there. It's fantastic. I fully support all of that. But charging me £1,200 a year to not drive my car, I think is is just, just unfair and regressive and, and you need to rethink the scheme. Okay. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dominic. I'm going to review your permission to talk. If you've got a future question, just raise your hand again. Um, but right now I've noticed that we have a few QA, QA questions, so I'm going to pass over to my co-host Emma to read some to the panellists. So the first question is from Daniel Clift. Um, for people who might wish or need to retain the use of a vehicle, the permit proposals are designed to push people towards the use of less polluting electric vehicles. What proposals are also being pushed forward to address the paucity of CV charging points in Hackney, particularly in some areas of the borough. Um, so I, I didn't quite catch all of that, but if the question was about the, the number of electric vehicle charging points across Hackney, um, you, you may or may not be aware that uh, Hackney has recently announced that it's going to be undertaking a significant rollout of electric charging uh, points across the borough, which is currently in the process uh, of looking to 
uh, to procure, which will see uh, approximately 1,500 electric charging points installed um, over the next few years for residents, um, so in resident bays and on estates, it's important to add, to provide uh, local and accessible uh, localities where people can charge vehicles overnight. Um, and another 500 charging points, which will be provided in, uh, in uh, pay and display parking bays to enable people who are on the go around Hackney to be able to charge their vehicle quickly and conveniently to remove many of the obstacles that I know a lot of people have got in relation to electric vehicles and their concern about how they're going to be able to charge those um, if they decide they want to make the investment and, and go down the electric vehicle route. So with that investment, we're going to see probably amongst the, the highest density of electric vehicle charging points of any local authority uh, in the UK. And it's a sign of our commitment to removing the obstacles to those people that do want to go electric um, that we're, we're putting that investment in. Okay, um, the next question again is from Daniel. Um, we have a camper van which we only use a few times a year for holidays. The permit for this costs us as much as it does for somebody who uses their vehicle every day. Is there any intention to move towards a road charging model to more, model to more fairly reflect low and high usage? Uh, so thanks, Daniel. As, as, I was, um, as I was saying when I was speaking to, to Dominic earlier, it's, it's something that uh, the mayor has said that he you know, feels, but the same reasons that I think have already been explained on, on tonight's conversation that it's the fairest approach and would take a, an even handed way in which that could be applied to everyone who drives through Hackney. Um, unfortunately, it is the case at the moment we aren't able to, we, we don't have the power to be able to look to do that. I think Dominic also highlighted, uh, and rightfully so, the need that if anything was to be, to be introduced, that needs to be done on a, a certain, a, a London-wide or multi-borough basis. Um, but it is something that I know conversations being had to see if local folks have been given a greater scope to look to do this, but you know that is, I think, some way off uh, in truth. And uh, and in the meantime, we still have a climate emergency crisis on our hands. We have poor air quality, and we have members who are committed to tackling both of those uh, and permit crisis together with the changes we're proposing around pricing for short stay parking and all other forms of parking within Hackney are the best tools we have available to make uh, a meaningful and demonstrable difference. Okay, um, the next question is from Daniel again. Uh, we are finding that numerous elderly residents on our estate are requiring assistance to deal with the process of applying for and managing their parking um, and blue badge permits due to the focus on online delivery. Do the council have any proposal to address this issue to avoid these vulnerable users being cut off from these vital system services? I can um, I can answer that one. Or did you want to Michael? I, I, all I was just going to say is that you know, we we work very hard on improving our online offer over the last um, over the last eight years, and we've now got ninety eight percent of people choosing to self-serve online. Um, we also send out by default um, paper application forms for anyone who can't or isn't able or is uncomfortable in using the online process so they can pay by filling in a paper application form and sending in a check. Um, and also this year we are going to be introducing a new parking customer services team who are being brought in specifically to provide uh, a more targeted helping hand for those who are having difficulties in accessing our services so that people can reach out to someone on the phone, have somebody to help walk through whatever they're having difficulty with and give them advice and support um, and be able to undertake tasks on their behalf so that those who do need assistance are able to do so by getting through and speaking to a real person. Okay, um, next question from Daniel. Why is the permit pricing structure flat, uh, structure flat rather than reflecting accessibility to public transport and services as captured in the TFL PTAL ratings? I can answer that. So um, it's because of the way we charge for parking, we charge through emissions based charging, which is on how much you pollute, not how close and how accessible we are to public transport. 
Yeah. Um, and last question from Liam. Can you introduce a robot element to the electric vehicle permit so that I can park in different zones across the borough? Islington have done this for years or have had this for years. I can also answer that. In the original um, consultation we did for the PEP last year, we did actually have proposals put forward for electric vehicle charging permit, um, e-roma permit, and that feedback has been is being considered currently. And based on that feedback, we'll make a decision as to whether or not it's going to be introduced. But that's something that has been suggested, something that was included in the parking enforcement plan proposals. We've received the feedback and we're just looking through that feedback now to, to decipher whether or not that's something that we're going to go forward with. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any um, questions in the chat? Just raise your hand. There's no QA um, questions. So um, we might go we'll launch our first um, poll. I can give that Emma Flores, please. And we'll ask about um, air quality. Oh, the, sorry, that's the wrong one, but never mind. Yeah, oh, um, sorry. yeah it's okay. Uh, Do you want me to? Um, yeah, we can uh, stop it, even though people are answering, which will be interesting. I think this is interesting. We have a few estate residents and workers in the borough, which, so we have a bit of a mixture. I think everyone's answered, so we're going to close the poll. Okay, so we have um, estate residents, um, most estate residents here, and we have a few, and well, that's interesting. Thank you for that. Oh, we've got one question in the Q&A. Oh, um, this is, um, Emma, would you like to read out the Q&A, please? Yeah, so this is from Liam. One last question. Is the parklet rollout going to be accelerated? Um, I that. Thank you, Emma. So um, in terms of the parklet, it's something that we're supporting in parking services. So it's our street seat counterpart service that are actually doing the rollout, but we're supporting it with regards to the space and we support it wholly and we do want to see more parklets across the borough. Uh, thank you, Jessica. I can see how Peter has raised his hand again, so I'm going to allow him to talk. So yeah, you can answer your question now, Peter. Hi, thanks again. I'll be very quick. I just wanted to know what happens now with this feedback that we've given you. Do you share this with the councillors and is it minuted and typed up so they can read it? Because they're not going to sit and watch this Zoom call, I hope. So is what does actually what happens? Hi, um, Jessica, can you answer the question, please? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, Peter, again. Yes. Yeah, so Thank you, Jessica. You keep, they keep giving you, you keep getting my, my questions, bless you. <laughs> I'm happy to answer them. I'm happy Thank to you. Answer. Thank you. So in terms of what we will do is that we do minute this meeting as well. So we've got a recording that we'll put up on the Sitting Space um, website to, for people to view if they missed it and they wanted to attend. And we'll also do a minute version of this meeting where we'll bring up all the main points that have been received and that will be included in our considerations when we close the consultations. We take the feedback that we get from the consultation that we get through telephone calls, through emails and through drop-in sessions and we put it all together so nothing's missed. So it will be presented um, in a report um, for councillors to review. And is that is that report um, available for us to scrutinise, or is that a, an internal document? I just, I mean, I'm not trying to catch anyone out here or sound like something out of, you know, some spy thriller. But I'm just intrigued as to how it works. Yeah. So the in terms of the document itself, it will be um, going through cabinet, and those documents are public once they're released. So it will once we've put forward a uh, a proposal that's been um, agreed upon that will then be put forward to a cabinet meeting. And when it's put through, forward for a cabinet meeting, it will become public. So it'll be on the council's website. You can actually review uh, the proposals that are going through. And then that will be um, discussed at a meeting, a cabinet meeting. Super, thank you. That's very, 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 very clear and helpful answer. Appreciate that, thank you. You're most welcome, Peter. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, so I'll remove your permission to talk. And if you have another question later, you can raise your hand. Um, I can see now um, Debbie has raised her hand. So I'm going to allow you to talk, Debbie. So you should be able to unmute yourself. And um, yeah, go. hi, hello. Um, I, uh, you just said that most of the people here, I mean, I don't know how many people are actually on this panel, but the lot of, a lot of us are on um, estates. Um, and our estate, we used to have a locked gate, but it kept getting vandalized. So uh, when we had a locked gate, there was no parking permit charge. It was just, we were given a key and we parked in the car park. Um, a few years ago, they changed that. I think we're on the third year now of having, a, having to pay to park in our little car parks. Um, but my, I suppose my question is, at the minute I pay 40 pounds a year, if it goes up to hundreds, are you going to tighten up the actual, for want of a better word, policing of the permits? Because I know for a fact that people drive in and park in my car park that don't live, you know, in my block and also don't probably have permits. And when I bumped into a traffic warden one time outside on the pavement, and I said to him, do you ever go in there? And he said, oh, no, we don't. We're street parking, um, whatever you call them, people. They have a special group of people that just do estate parking. And I said, well, how often do they do it? And he said, oh, I don't know, not very often. So it's sort of like, I feel like I'm paying for something. And I probably in that whole three years, I've seen like two parking tickets. And also, finally, on that same point, but having no actual permit to display, whilst everyone thinks, oh yeah, that's great, no paper. But it's ridiculous because there's, it would say quite clearly then in every car, yeah, you've got a permit to park in Z70 or whatever you might have. At the minute, there's no way of knowing that anyone in that car park should be there, shouldn't be there. I just feel like, will you be increasing the visits to the estate car parks? I'll take that one if I can. Um... Thank you, Debbie, for your question. Uh, the short answer is yes, we will. So okay. uh, historically, estates, um, uh, our housing department had a, a service level agreement that specified a certain number of visits across all of our estates. Um, but we I've never, I just but in there for a second. I've never seen a traffic warden in my car park ever. <laughs> okay, well, look, what, what we have had in place has typically seen on average um, about a visit every two days on average across all of our estates but mm -hmm. in terms of where those visits have been focused they've been focused on those estates which have got the most number of problems in terms of vehicles parking there that shouldn't be um, so that we can take um, action where necessary as part and uh, parcel with the proposals around the permitting um, process that we've talked about there's also you know a real recognition uh, within our service and from the conversations we had last uh, summer as part of the consultation exercise that you know, any changes needed to see the gap between the level of enforcement that's seen on estates versus what's seen on streets close so that you know the services that are provided are equitable um, and so we will be introducing that you may be aware that uh, Hackney Council recently uh, brought back in-house our parking uh, enforcement service mm. um, as of uh, the 1st of April and so we are working at the moment on changing or reviewing with a view to changing the way that we um, effectively distribute our, our CEOs, civil enforcement officers or traffic wardens as they're more commonly known so that we get um, more visits in places where we've got problems um, and so that we can ensure that particularly for estates where you know, there is finite parking space, um, where the demand for those spaces is extremely high um, and where you know, a small number of people parking there who don't have permission to do so can have a really negative impact on the mm -hmm. ability of residents who do have a parking permit to find somewhere to, to park when they, they come home, um, which you know, generates a, an undue level of anxiety. So we will be increasing the number of visits on estates uh, as we go forward over the next two or three years. Mm, sorry, there's an ice cream van outside. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, sometimes we seem to get a proliferation of work vans. 
and I think they should they're supposed to have separate permits anyway I'm just saying I don't want to be like a I think I said this earlier on some sort of weird spy but I am part of the tenants association mm -hmm. and I would say that if people displayed a permit in their vehicle it would give other people the opportunity to keep an eye on it it would also discourage people from just on spec illegal parking because they would know that it was obvious immediately that they shouldn't be there um and you know then we could we can tell our estate <coughs> excuse me estate officers what's what's going on at the minute i feel like i've got no idea who should or shouldn't be in that car park no I, i'm not I'll, I'll be honest in, in in practice what we found when we used to send out the old paper permits is that in terms of the number of reports we get from you know, concerned residents like yourself of you know vehicles parking consistently that didn't appear to have a parking permit on display um, we would see very, very few of those kind of requests coming through to us. On the mm. flip side, we had you know, a lot of complaints and frustration from members of the public um, saying, look, you know, you've got an on, you've got the ability for me to order a permit online. Um, and you know, it paid for, it's all on your system, and yet it's taken me, you know, a couple of days for that permit to come through. You know, in this modern day and age, surely mm. you should be able to do this automatically um which is why you know we moved away from from those physical permits um to electric ones and you know mm. the, the number of complaints around people's ability to change their details update their vehicles whether it be a courtesy car or um or that they've got a, a new vehicle um have dropped markedly as a result so on balance certainly based on the evidence that we see coming through to us mm. um the change has been a, a very positive one um the, the question around how people can check whether or not vehicles do have permits or not is something though that I'll certainly take away um, and, uh, and and consider in terms of what we can potentially do to, to assist. Yeah, because somewhere, the, obviously, the wardens must have a list of who should and shouldn't be there because otherwise they wouldn't be able to issue tickets. I mean, I'm not saying I, I really don't want to spend my life looking at lists of car number plates, but, you know, it's... It's just, it is frustrating, particularly because I suppose it's quite new that I've had to pay at all, but 40 pounds, and I'm like the other guy who was chatting earlier on, I actually don't drive in Hackney because mm -hmm. of the congestion, not the, necessarily the pollution, but just the traffic queues. I walk or take a bus. I use my car to visit my elderly mother who lives in Kent. So I drive down there several times a month. So I wouldn't want to give up my car, but quite frankly, it does seem mad to pay hundreds and hundreds of pounds just to park it outside my flat when I'm not even, I pollute a tiny bit of hackney between yeah. my flat and the Blackwall tunnel, and then I'm gone. You know, so I know there's nothing you can do about that, but it, 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 it this thing of charging everybody, whether they're driving hackney or not, is is a little problematic for me. Thanks, Kathy. Really appreciate you raising those points. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Um, if you have a, a further question, you can um, raise your hand to, um, again, but I've removed your ability to talk. Um, we have a Q&A &A question. Um, does, if Emma, would you like to just read that quickly? It's a correction, I believe. Yeah, this is a correction from Liam. He, he said, sorry, I didn't mean parklet. I meant cycle hangers and secure parking rollout. The reason for EV permits, price hike, I believe, thanks. Uh, um, I'll, I'll happily take, take that question. I didn't quite catch all of the detail, but in, in terms of what Hackney Council is doing around cycle hangers, um, uh, parking services actually took over the management of cycle hangers in Hackney uh, in 2019. And since then, we've grown the number of hangers in Hackney from uh, around 400 to now 650, which is the most hangers of, of any uh, London borough. Um, and uh, in the latest uh, Merrill Manifesto ahead of the, the election um, earlier on this spring, um, you may have seen that uh, Mayor Glanville committed uh, over the course of the next four years to introducing um, enough cycle hangers to make space for a further 4,000 people to secure um, a, a space should they wish to. So um, I'm currently busy working on, on pulling together proposals for how we look to do that. Um, and, uh, and so we hope to be able to announce 
later on this year an exciting rollout plan of an awful lot more hangers to cater for the undoubted demand there is um, from both residents who've got bikes but nowhere that's particularly convenient to store them or for those who want to be able to cycle but for whom the lack of any suitable storage at home is preventing them from actually getting on their bike and getting around so it's something we're hugely committed to um, and we will be putting a major investment in over the course of the next few years. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Um, I think we've just had, I think, Debbie, is that your hand still up from your first question or do you have an, another question? Did your hand still raise for me? Thank you. Hi, Sorry. Hi Debbie, do you have a question or is your hand just still raised? Um, no, I thought you said you were going to turn my oh, no, off. Do I have to do something as well? Oh, oh you can. Um, I'll oh, your I, hand yeah. then. Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry, no yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No more question for me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I can see we've just got um, we'll just go for the uh, the other Q and A, and then we'll come to you, Liam. Just so I think Daniel has a question. Yeah, question from Daniel. Estate permits are described as being twelve month only. Would an existing permit simply be renewed at the time or would the resident need to go back into the queue for an available permit? Uh, so I'm happy to take that one. So we know that on estates, parking availability is finite. So uh, in recognition of that, for any resident who has an existing estate permit, um, we notify everyone uh, initially six weeks before their permit is due to expire um, and we send out regular reminders until the expiry of that permit. So provided that a permit is renewed uh, before the expiry of that permit, then that space will continue to be protected for, uh, for that particular individual. For all of our estates, we know how many parking spaces we've got and we don't sell more permits than we've got spaces. We do do slightly undersell to allow for some element of um, uh, of visitors, um, which we take an estate by estate approach based on the particular demands there are and the feedback we get from estate officers, uh, TMOs and TRAs, depending on how each individual estate is managed. But no, to, to reassure you, if you've got an estate permit um, and you renew it before it's expiry, then you'll continue to be able to hold one. Thank you, Michael, for that question. If you've got any more um, Q&As, you can always just put them there. Um, next, next we're going to go to Liam, who has his hand raised, so I'm going to allow you to talk, Liam, so you can ask your question. Hi, I'll keep it super brief. Um, just on the um, EV pricing again, um, is there a, um, I couldn't see it in the documentation, is there an explanation of the differential and the, the logic behind that 500% increase from a kind of, I know you're you know, arguing about the point about particulates from the tyres of EVs, etc., the cost of cycle parking, but is there something more detailed that bears that out? I could find on the website, for example. Um, Michael, if you would like to answer this question, thank you. Uh, so in answer to that question, look, the drivers of the, of the two ones that you've just, uh, you've just referenced there. Um, so at present, uh, a state, uh, sorry, um, cycle hangers cost 43 pounds 50 uh, for an annual rental. Um, and so, you know, we propose setting the, the base fee for an electric vehicle permit at £50 to ensure that in terms of that logical set of prices across the various different services that we provide on street for, uh, for residents um, in terms of the, the transport options we've got, um, the sense of £50 was that it kept prices okay. uh, as, as low as we could without going uh, below the, uh, the price for, for a cycle hanger so that that pricing incentive was very much there for those who, who wanted to be able to um, take up a cycle parking space. Okay, so sorry, thank you for exp re explaining that, I do get that. It just feels that the, the use case of a car, I'm not stating the obvious here, but a car does a slightly different job to a bike. <laughs> um, and a car is obviously a convenience and a luxury. I know that Hackney Cycling Campaign, of which I'm part, would argue that you can get a bike anywhere. You could climb up a mountain on a bike. Um, you can, but really, with a family and shopping, et cetera, they do different jobs and a bike isn't as capable in that sense. So I understand the logic around trying to have some sort of parity between the prices, but I just feel that 
And I still feel that going to 50 from practically nothing is such a massive increase that maybe it could be incremented slightly differently, particularly over the next couple of years um, to make it a bit more of an, uh, a, a palatable increase. So I'd like, that, I'd like that feedback to be logged, please. And one other quick question as well is around, is there a distinction, and I couldn't see it on the grid, around um, hybrids versus pure electric? I could see there was an emissions element, but um, that might need to be drawn out when, in, when you're articulating your plans. Uh, so, so the answer to your, your follow-up question there is no, there isn't. So we, we base prices purely on the uh, registered um, CO2 emissions um, per kilometer with obviously the additional diesel surcharge, um, which is levied against diesel vehicles. Um, I think, as Oscar mentioned earlier on, we are proposing to make a change in terms of um, providing exemption for diesel vehicles, which, from the diesel surcharge, that is, um, <coughs> where they meet the much more new stringent real driving emission 2 test, which is now the gold standard uh, introduced in, in January 2020, um, which is now tests of putting vehicles through their paces with a driver at the wheel, driving on real world. Sure, sure, yeah. Showing much more is, realistic in that respect, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's throwing up very different test results to those that have previously been run in a lab, and which you know the Volkswagen scandal uh, and others showed to be uh, so easily cheated by, sure. by major road manufacturers. So, I just, I just feel sorry, just to interrupt, but I just feel that in terms of hybrids, I mean, not, not all hybrids are equal, and hybrids are not the same as pure EV. I mean, my car's literally got, I emit zero emissions. I mean, we can talk, put particulates to one side. <clears throat> and if you're driving, for example, like a, like a Lexus hybrid, um, that can only go so far on a charge, and then it kicks into a petrol engine, which then poses a different set of questions. That seems like a quite a, not to be critical here, but that seems like quite a big oversight when someone could be literally driving within the borough and then flip, pay, paying an EV charge, and then their engine kicks in, their petrol engine. Um, I do feel that hybrids, I mean, they tax differently, right? They've got a different benefit in kind level. Pure electrics versus hybrids. There's a, there's a precedent there from HMRC. I think you need to look at that personally. It could be another band. And it wouldn't be that difficult to implement, I would imagine. Thanks very much for your feedback. I think there's some really interesting points that we'll certainly take on board. So thank you, Liam. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liam. If you'd like to lower your hand, no, I'll do. This. Okay, thank you. Okay, if you have another question, just like raise your hand again. I can just see we have had a few questions pop up all of a sudden. Um, yeah, I will go to uh, Peter again uh, first, and then I'll go to we'll go to the Q and A. Hi, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm just picking up on what Liam was saying. I'm, I'm, am I missing something here? Maybe I'm being really dim, but. Liam's saying that his permit is going up, but if it produces zero emissions, surely the permit price is nothing. What have I missed here? What, how can that price, I mean, it says in your band one, zero emissions, year one, price zero. So what, why is Liam, why is he saying that the price of his permit for an electric vehicle is increasing? Peter, if I can answer for that one, because I don't want Gosh to get the chance to answer. Please, sorry, I'm being really, I'm, maybe I'm being really dim here. I don't know. No, 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 not, not at all. So, um, what Gosco explained at the top of today's session was that the proposals we put forward last uh, summer did include yeah. uh, proposals to have a zero uh, emissions price for electric vehicles. Right. Um, ah. uh, and we got lots of feedback <clears throat> in that consultation exercise. They yeah. said that that was the wrong approach because uh, it didn't account for the fact that whilst the vehicle may not be producing any tailpipe emissions in terms of yeah. um, not, noxious gases um, and CO2, that all vehicles through tyre wear and through um, brake dust do contribute, um, and there is you know, scientific evidence that backs this up, do contribute to local uh, particulate matter which you know, is a, a contribution but the, to but the to sorry to jump percentage. in but but the pep that i access mm. via your website doesn't say that or am i i'm pretty sure i clicked on the right one have you uh, have you updated the pep document since the first consultation <laughs> to reflect that change so Gosk, do you want to take that point yeah. please 
Yeah, so in terms of the parking enforcement plan, because we've consulted on that part, and we're just literally looking at the parking permit crisis this time around, the document right. that was originally put out has not been amended at all. It's still the original one because we're not asking for feedback on all the proposals. We're only asking them feedback on the parking permit. <coughs> okay, so how can I ask then, how would we know if we didn't come to this meeting that you've amended things like that table and how would we know what other amendments you've made to the PEP which we've been consulted on if the PEP that you have available for us to look at does not reflect what you're actually now going to do because what we only are the reason what I would say to that is that the only thing we're asking you to look at is the prices in the PEP nothing else so all the other parts of the PEP we've already the PEP we've already um, consulted on they've already received lots of feedback for all those elements so all we were asking people to do was look at the prices that were in the PEP previously and compare right. that to the prices we're putting forward now and all other elements of the PEP. We, and, it's, and in the, the, the consultation booklet and questionnaire, we've made it quite clear that that's all we're asking for. Um, right. uh, well, okay, so sorry, I'm being real, I'm, maybe I'm just being thick, but I didn't see where these new I, i've where these new pricing schedule is shown i have not seen that document i've i've looked at the i followed the link to look at the old uh, in the email that i received yeah. um and i've then gone to that's the hackney website and it says here's the pep and i've looked at that but i haven't seen a link to download the revised table 5.1 and table 5.3 i mean maybe i've missed it if you scroll down further on that page, it sets out with the way the page is okay. out, we're explaining that we, we've done the consultation. We're now seeking further feedback on changes yeah. uh, that we're proposing, talking about starting price for electric vehicles, diesel yeah. surcharges, and which vehicles qualify and why we're doing this. And then right. below that, you've got a booklet and a questionnaire, which is it spells out all of the revised proposals that we're seeking ah. feedback on. So I've stuck right. the links in the chat if you want. I to saw that. Yeah. That. Thank you. Alternatively, you can you can do it by the website. Okay, so this is in the book. It's in the booklet. These revised yes. tables. Yes. Right. I mean, okay. Thank you. I would say that's not hugely clear, but that's where the amended information is i mean it doesn't you know it's a bit late in the day now but i would say for future reference i mean it doesn't say we've changed stuff if you want to see the latest information you need to do, you need to look at the booklet can i just add um Peter, that we do have that information in the actual document of the online questionnaire and i'll just present my oh, okay. to show you. yeah it's under related information so oh. just bear with me one second while i just put it into yeah. So I can show you and then you'll be able to see that it is there. So what we did on the main page and the summary page, we've got the, uh, a section which is the um, booklet and the questionnaire. And as you go through the consultation, this is the question and it's got related information. And through there, it's okay. the, the price and the reasoning. Thank you. That's in the actual part where you would give your feedback. And mm -hmm. at the top of this section, it says, please click on the related information below to view the revised parking. Brilliant. Yeah, before. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, listen, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I should probably have just clicked on a few more of the links. It just didn't seem very clear to me, but it is now, so it's fine. I just, yeah. you know, so just we've remote there, apps. We've got it there. Sorry? We've also got it in um, at the bottom. So you can actually um, check the... Um, let me just go to the, at the when you log on to the consultation document and you go to uh -huh. the main page at the bottom we've got um the questionnaire and we've also got the um okay. the, the book in the booklet it brilliant as well. you can print it off you can print it off and it'll be there too super thank you thank you very much that's uh, let's deal with that very nicely cheers <laughs> okay uh, thank you peter i'm gonna um you can like to lower your hand and remove your permission to talk. Um, I'm conscious of, we only have a few minutes left, but we have some question uh, Q and A questions. So, um, Emma, can you just read out the last um, two Q and A questions? Yeah, this is from Daniel. It says Hackney is currently refusing to give residents on Lincoln Court Estate access to the majority of the available existing parking capacity. Is there any intention to review the use of the wasted capacity, particularly particularly in respect of the opportunity to provide significant additional EV cargo bike 
bicycle parking, this refers to parking on the estate, the above question. I'm happy to take that one if, if I can. Um, so I, I'm not aware of the specific uh, challenges that um, that you've got on Lincoln Court, Daniel. Um, I don't know if you're um, happy to come on and just explain um, by way of, of the conversation what, uh, what the challenges are that you're experiencing to help me understand that before I can go away and look into that and come back to you. Um, you can talk if you want, Daniel. Can you hear me? Hi, Daniel. Hello. Yes. Um, yeah, we, we have um, uh, a number of uh, uh, podium uh, play decks with garages underneath, which are part of the infrastructure of the estate. And um, the uh, parking services team have been refusing to give people access to them. Largely, people, residents on the estate are, are blanked in terms of applying for permits. There's no waiting list. There's no opportunity for people to um, get access to that parking. Uh, and there are opportunities within that to provide EV charging spaces, cargo bike parking, et cetera, et cetera. I'm uh, just wondering, because you were saying that the um, management of that parking is going to move from sort of the state services to the parking team, whether there would be opportunities to review that. Um, so I didn't quite catch the beginning uh, of what you said there, Daniel. Um, did you, are you referring to garages? Is this undercroft parking or are we talking on-street parking spaces outside of Lincoln Court? Both. Both. Okay. Okay. There, is, there is no, there is no uh, route for residents to apply for um, parking permits on Lincoln Court Estate, whether in the garages or in the outside parking bays. Um, there's no waiting list and parking services. Uh, the estate uh, team have been um, just refusing residents um, any kind of access to uh, parking. So the only residents who can park on the estate are the ones who've had parking permits for um, for uh, historical reasons. Okay, well I, I will happily look into that. I don't have the details available to provide you with a, a useful answer today, but uh, I'm just looking at my colleagues on this call. If we've got your, uh, your contact details, Daniel, then uh, let me look into this and see if I can come back to you with a with some an answer to at least some of your points um, by the end of the week. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. I'm just really your uh, permission to talk. Um, we have now there's no no further questions in the Q and A. Um, so um, I'm going to um, so if there's none, I think otherwise I think we'll close the meeting now as we've reached our allocated time. So um, thank you for everyone for taking part today. Your feedback has been extremely useful and insightful. And I'd just like to remind you to take part in the online consultation if you haven't done so already. I believe uh, Mark will put a link in the chat like, which will take you to the online consultation. Uh, so please um, do follow the link and give us your views if you haven't done it already. So um, my co colleagues will also include the, our email address and our telephone number in the chat so you can talk to any of the parking policy team if you've got any further questions. So um, before we um, wrap up, can I just ask the panel if they have any last comments before we close? I just want to thank everyone for attending today and engaging with us. It's really good that you've come on board today to give us your feedback and we need this feedback to help hopefully help structure and um, evolve the parking enforcement plan. Yeah, and, and I'd just like to echo what Gosper said there. I think it's been a really interesting discussion. Lots of people coming with different viewpoints um, and how the proposals on the table, you know, uh, impact upon them and, and, and your community. So um, it's been really, really interesting. Lots of food for thought for us. Um, and thank you so much for joining us this evening and taking part. Uh, uh, once again, so thanks again for joining and giving your feedback today. And enjoy your rest of your evening, everybody. Um, if there's any questions or further questions, just send it and we will email you back. So uh, thanks again and goodbye. Thank you, everyone.